into it. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, this is our June COPE meeting. Um, if there are any of you I haven't met, my name is Ashley Griswa. I'm one of the co-chairs for COPE 2021. I'm the incoming chair. Um, and Kendall Klaus, our chair this year, is unavailable to join us tonight, um, but she helped organize this event. And so um, always grateful to her for everything that she's doing. And thank you to our sponsors, of course, who make all of our events possible. Just a quick note about a couple upcoming events. Uh, next week, Monday, we have a lunchtime event. Mark Kudair from the city will be presenting on the heat island mitigation efforts that the city is undertaking and um, the importance of that as our city grows. And then on June 8th, on Tuesday in the evening, uh, we'll have uh, our first event on environmental justice, which Jaime, our environmental justice subcommittee chair has organized. So that will be a really exciting event and really a continuation of this conversation, um, talking about some of the housing and affordability and other development disparity throughout Austin, kind of the history of how that came about and what's, what's going on now and how we're moving forward. And then on June 17th, we'll have our fourth and final AIAU event. Uh, so that will be during lunch and that will be on resilience and adaptation. We'll be talking, covering some kind of generic vocabulary and key concepts, and then we'll be diving in. There'll be a panel discussion about kind of what happened in Texas with the grid failure and the subsequent sort of water and food and data outages and everything that um, was going on here in Texas and specifically in Austin. Um, during the la during this last winter storm. And then our next meeting will be July 8th, again, the first Thursday of the month. So uh, we'll be continuing our discussion about transportation and um, that one will get into transportation electrification. So um, please come back for that one. <laughs> uh, so today we're still in the transportation and land use section of the Austin uh, Climate Equity Plan. And we're addressing um, the goals related to development and growth in um, development corridors. And specifically, last week or last month, excuse me, we focused on more commercial development and some of the work happening there. And um, we are, you know, going to touch on some of that tonight to make sure, again, touching on um, anti-displacement and how we're focusing on. Um, equitable growth uh, for commercial and, of course, for residential, which is going to be most of our focus tonight on um, affordable housing development um, opportunities and efforts that the city is undertaking and how we're making sure to preserve affordable housing and actually introduce new affordable housing, even as uh, the city continues to grow and housing becomes really expensive. Um, so we're looking forward to having with us tonight two great um, speakers from the city who work very closely on these issues. Um, Nefertiti Jackman is the Community Displacement Prevention Officer, um, so she'll be sharing uh, some of her work with us first, and then we'll have Mandy DeMeo, um, who's a Community Development Administrator, working again in that affordable housing um, sector. Um, for the city of Boston. So thank you both for joining us today. And I'm gonna stop sharing. Nefertiti, please uh, feel free to share your slides and, and um, introduce yourself a little bit. Let's start it. Sure, absolutely. Um, thank you, Ashley and AIA Austin uh, for allowing us to share this evening. Um, and I like some of your goals. I mean, uh, so I'm happy to share with you and with my colleague, uh, Mandy DeMayo, really about I'm not about some of the strategies that we have that uh, that the city of Austin has set to address affordability and to also address issues around displacement. I'm going to start sharing my screen as I shared. If you uh, in the beginning, if you have questions, I'm okay with you. You know, presenting your questions throughout. The presentation. So uh, I just asked that you uh, you're going to have to speak up because I won't be able to see you. So, and I'm okay with the questions. But uh, 
as Mandy and I both work for the Housing and Planning Department, my focus will be on preventing displacement and centering equity. Uh, and just really highlighting some of the work that we are doing to address displacement. I'll share with you briefly the mission of the department and our strategic priorities around displacement prevention, and then highlight some of the core programs that we have begun to support tenant stabilization. And then also one of the core programs under there is the rent program for emergency rental assistance and then share with you another project that is uh, benefiting the entire city and just share with you what we plan to do to ensure that the benefit can be felt by all residents. And then also there was a question, what can you do? And so I definitely want to leave room uh, to discuss and share that. I don't know if you know this or not, but the Housing and Planning Department is a newly merged department. And so we merged with the Housing, with the uh, Planning and Zoning Department in October of 2020. So the newly formed department, the Housing and Planning Department, um, is it, we're fairly new. So we just completed work on creating a new mission to make sure that we really encompass uh, and highlight the work that both departments help to collectively achieve. And so uh, the new vision or mission statement is the Housing and Planning Department partners with the community to shape a more equitable Austin and to prevent the displacement of people and services using planning disciplines and affordable housing resources. And this uh, mission was created working with a, a number of people collaborating through our, throughout the department for a number of weeks and many hours and really trying to align the, the skill source and resources as a, along with the mandate that we each have to address uh, affordable housing issues throughout the city of Boston. So I, um, some of the work that I do is focus on really displacement prevention strategies and the displacement prevention uh, priorities that I will share with you. Um, keep in mind that I don't, these are not all within my portfolio, but these are the strategies that have been adopted throughout the department. So we are all working on these collectively together. So displacement prevention is a priority throughout the department. And there are 15 strategies, and I, I really like to share with people that these 15 strategies or strategic priorities were informed by a number of processes. I like to say that they were, they are community informed because um, there were a number of recommendations that came forward through task force. Uh, there was the report on uh, institutionalized racism from the mayor's task force on institutionalized racism. There's also a report that came forth from the people's plan. Um, there was also the anti-displacement task force, which I had the privilege of serving on. And that's how I got involved with this work um, that also provided recommendations. So uh, throughout the years, there were a number of recommendations that came forward that the city used and NHCD, Neighborhood Housing and Community Development at that time, decided this is what we're gonna focus on. But we worked, there was a process, I won't say they just decided, but there was a process in terms of how uh, certain priorities or strategies rose to the top, looking at available resources, understanding um, what was in the control of the department at that time and what were some of the best bets or best use of the resources that we had available. So I'm just gonna highlight a few, maybe one or two on each page, but there are 15 strategic priorities that sort of um, guides the work of the department and and these are not in any particular order, but the first that I will highlight is implementation of a preference policy to prioritize new city subsidized affordable units for income qualified households that are appropriately sized 
to the unit and or have ties to the city. Uh, the, the preference policy that the city of Austin has adopted is similar to what many people know of as the right to return policy. And this is designed to allow people who have historic ties who uh, at one time or another live in an area where um, black or brown communities had historically lived, but were displaced as a result of any number of pressures that often impact communities of color. It could have been rising taxes. It could have been an inability to afford increasing housing costs or you know, so so something like that, which could have impacted them. So we're looking at ways to create new opportunities. So the preference policy is only for city owned properties and families can um, apply um, to the programs under certain criteria and guidelines. So that's one of the priorities. And I'll just Go on to number two before I head to the next page of uh, incorporating robust tenant protections for all rental properties receiving uh, city support. So uh, this was very important because I don't, uh, there are about 53% of Austinites who are renters. And so we heard loud and clear from the recommendations that we needed to do more to protect uh, the rights of tenants and to provide the support financially as well as educational awareness uh, for tenants to make sure that they are less vulnerable to displacement. Some of the other uh, programs include, again, focus on tenants supporting, number seven I have, support tenant organizing and engagement and provide legal and other assistance to tenants facing eviction or displacement. Uh, we have a new contract uh, with Texas Real Grande Legal Aid, which uh, they are now providing legal representation to families at 80% median family income and below to represent them in cases uh, where they are facing eviction or might uh, be displaced for another reason. And then as we go to the final page, highlighting some of the, the last five uh, uh, displacement prevention uh, priorities, number 11 is support capacity building for community development corporations. One of the things that we are aware of, and Mandy is gonna speak to more um, in depth, is that there is a, a large need for more affordable housing. Um, the city cannot meet that need alone in terms of developing affordable housing units, producing more affordable housing units. So uh, it's gonna be very important that we partner with other community development corporations with a focus on building and preserving affordable housing along with other smaller developers. So some of the work, some of the grants that we have provided um, in this past year included over $400,000 to support capacity building for community development corporations with the hope and expectation that we can increase the um, ecosystem of um, affordable housing developers uh, in Austin. As I shared with you, there are a number of tenant stabilization programs that we have in Austin. Many of these are new. These are uh, mostly new. There, there's one program that has that the City of Austin Housing Department has supported throughout the years. But recognizing that over 53% of Austinites are renters, um, we understand that there is a great need to invest in uh, tenants. Um, and, and again, tenants are one of the, uh, being a tenant is a characteristic of a person's vulnerability to uh, displacement. And with the programs that we created, uh, our tenant stabilization programs, one of the key goals was ensuring that we were designing programs with equity in mind and using information from Texas Housers. Uh, they created this graph and they created some 
characteristics of programs that were designed with equity. And so this has been sort of the guiding mark for many of the tenant stabilization programs that we have, including the emergency rental assistance programs, um, ensuring that the programs are rapid, right? Allowing for the tenants and landlords to submit applications or begin the application process for uh, emergency rental assistance, making sure that the assistance is, is accessible, working with community partners. And this is what we are doing. Um, so the definitions that Texas Housers have includes a program that's rapid, accessible, accountable, targeted, and sustained. And the, the sentences that we have on there represent what we are doing to make sure we're meeting those goals. So we have worked with community partners to reduce the barriers to application. Um, our application for emergency rental assistance is all online. We wanted to make sure that it is mobile friendly uh, for people who don't have access to a computer or who might have other uh, challenges with technology. Um, but then we also want to make sure that the program is accountable. And one of the ways that you do that is make sure that you're capturing clear demographic data and so that we can report out who is being served, where they're being served, and other demographic information. So if we need to redirect some of our efforts in terms of uh, reaching certain populations, we can do that. Um, and then also, uh, we've been able to prioritize households at 30% um, average median income. So that has been our goal for all of the emergency rental assistance programs that we have had. And then also being able, the, during this last round of funding, we've been able to provide rental assistance for at least 12 months, which has allowed uh, individual families to uh, recover in a way that they're not just getting by, but they're able to hopefully catch up on some of the bills that they have and provide a, a stable foundation for them as they uh, can get one of their basic needs met through these programs. I'm not gonna go through this list, but um, this shows or provides an overview of the various tenant stabilization programs that we have uh, launched or executed contracts that we have executed within this past fiscal year. It does not include uh, our first emergency rental assistance program, uh, which Mandy and I partnered together. Mandy led the creation of a Rent 1.0, and subsequently we had Rent 2.0 and 2.5. But uh, as a result of federal funding, we have been able to provide over 20, well, really to date, over $54 million in uh, emergency rental assistance and other tenant stabilization programs to residents of Austin. And then briefly, I'll share with you information on our rent program. And this program was created for Austin tenants who had low incomes and who were also impacted by COVID-19. So Rent 3.0, the current program that we had, we've been able to provide about $25 million of direct assistance for Austin renters. I do wanna highlight that uh, the city of Austin has been able to distribute over 70% of funding uh, to date. So uh, we are fortunate enough that we have not run into the various challenges that a number of programs uh, have seen. And it is a challenge getting new programs up and running and making sure that you are serving those who are most vulnerable. So this is just a, a dashboard. I won't go into great length uh, with this information because uh, there's a lot more that I want to share with you. Um, but this is just a dashboard showing some demographic information of who is served, uh, how much rental assistance people are receiving. And, um, and there's other pages that show in what zip codes people are living, what occupations, 
And so that can be found um, on our dashboard. I want to stop before I go into Project Connect uh, and see if there are any questions. None? OK. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through this really quick. So I apologize if it uh, seems like I'm rushing, but I know there's, there's a lot to cover. And I want to make sure we give enough time for Mandy uh, as well and your questions. So this uh, timeline here shows the program sequence for the investment of the $300 million Project Connect anti-displacement funding. As you can see, the goal is to invest about $100 million in anti-displacement funding within the first three years. And then it um, sort of in, sort of tapers off. But in that beginning year, three years, it's, it's critical that we invest early. And as you will see, uh, investing early is one of the critical components of ensuring that households are not displaced, right? Making sure affordable housing is um, identified early and placed along um, the lines. And successfully fulfilling the mandate, making sure that uh, we're designing this project with equity in mind, um, we have to re rebalance the power and decision-making structures and make sure that there is accountability to those most directly impacted by displacement pressures. And so what does that mean, rebalancing power and decision-making? Basically, what that means is we are beginning to include voices that have often been uh, excluded from the decision-making processes, including the planning processes, and we're engaging with those communities early, earlier, people who are most impacted earlier, getting insight and information and understanding the needs of the communities that are most impacted. And as you see there, there has been a $300 million for Project Connect to include uh, the acquisition of property and the implementation of a number of anti-displacement strategies. I'm going to uh, just go briefly past this. We use a, we work with or formed a group called the Catalyst, who helped to inform the creation of the equity tool that is really um, giving us guidance around how funds will be used and uh, what will be the priorities for community. And so this chart here really shows levels of. Uh, community engagement and you create an environment to advance equity. And so we can start on this scale where, you know, you ignore community, right? Uh, you deny community access to decision-making processes, but the goal is to get uh, to somewhere in four or five where we are uh, collaborating with community and deferring to community, where community has ownership in the processes, right? And there's an opportunity to uh, unlock the power of community and help to have community informed decisions that lead the processes, even at the level uh, in terms of working with cities, engaging the community to hear their priorities and are uh, including in the design of programs and policies and the implementation thereof. And um, I'm going to I'm going to stop there. Let me see if there's anything. There's a lot more, and I think I we could have really uh, I could have focused on any number of these projects that we have. But I'll, I'll stop here at some of the key deliverables for this equity tool that we are creating. Um, it will help us to create the, uh, we'll have, it's, it's really three components, I'm sorry, for the Project Connect equity tool, which is basically a framework which will help us to evaluate the Project Connect 
um, various elements and see who benefits or who is burdened. It will also help us to frame the neighborhood level strategies uh, and really inform uh, equitable, de equitable development policies and un inform other city investments. So I'm going um, to stop there. The last slide just really shows some of the key things um, to consider engaging early on the planning and land use and um, you know, really deploying neighborhood level strategies so that we don't have a one size fits all solution for communities, we really have to understand the neighborhood nuances uh, when addressing problems around equitable development and placement. So, I'm going to stop there, and uh, we can we can go to Mandy's preservation our presentation as she'll discuss uh, the affordable housing. Thanks so much, Nefertiti. Um, I am going to attempt to share my screen. Let's see how successful this can be. Uh, there we go. Can folks see a big yep. blue housing and planning? Okay, perfect. Um, again, I'm Mandy DeMao. I work with Nefertiti Jackman um, in the housing and planning department. Uh, I am super excited to be here tonight because uh, all of our work is really interconnected and related, and I think we're all headed, the good news is, headed in the same direction. I'll go over this pretty quickly. Please jump in if you have any questions, and I'm hoping to end uh, showing you an interactive tool that's publicly available that will show our affordable housing investments and its relationship to Project Connect, which I think you all will find interesting. Um, as uh, you know, if you've been in Austin for any amount of time and read the newspaper, we're growing exponentially in the city of Austin, which of course is impacting our affordability issues, our home values. Uh, we just had a presentation from the Austin Board of Realtors and our median home sales price in the city of Austin is now uh, approaching $600,000, um, which is extraordinary. And it seems to only be going in the up direction um, and rent, of course, at the same time is increasing um, pretty steadily. Of course, our median um, incomes are fairly flat where we see increases in median incomes. It's generally due to an influx of newcomers um, who are coming for higher wage jobs and doesn't necessarily reflect um, across the board income levels. Our current median family income was just released for the city of Austin. It's for a family of four is $98,900. Um, but of course we have in the city of Austin, we have kind of a barbell effect. We have a lot of folks who are at the lower end of the income scale and a lot of folks who are at the higher end of the income scale. And our department and the housing and planning department is uh, focused on folks at that lower end of the income scale. Nefertiti went over the mission of our department. Um, I am, Nefertiti's right in the middle in displacement prevention. I'm at the bottom with program delivery and real estate services. That's what I'm gonna focus on. But across all five divisions, um, affordability, inclusivity, and uh, displacement prevention is woven throughout all of our work. Um, you all, I'm sure, are familiar with the Imagine Austin Comprehensive Plan. Um, which really guides our work. There are, of course, eight Imagine Austin priority programs, and we fall under um, economic opportunity and affordability. Our work as a department is guided by the Strategic Housing Blueprint, which was adopted by our city council in 2017. Um, this timeline shows kind of the evolution of some of our work, but in 2017, we adopted the blueprint um, in 2018, uh, voters approved $250 million in affordable housing bonds. Um, in 2019, we really started in earnest the bond implementation and the blueprint implementation. And in 2020, um, we released our first scorecards for our um, strategic housing blueprints. Uh, and we also, as Nefertiti talked about, approved both Project Connect um, the overall transit investment, and then the accompanying $300 anti-displacement investment. 
Regarding the blueprint, there are a couple of really important numbers to keep in mind. Um, the, the blueprint established goals for the city related to housing uh, development and preservation. So the overall goal that was adopted by city council was 135,000 new units needed to be created in order to, over 10 years, so 13,500 units a year, um, in order to accommodate our existing population growth and anticipated population growth and provide enough residential opportunities um, for folks who live in the city of Austin or who want to live in the city of Austin. These um, 135,000 units were broken out by uh, median family income level or MFI as we call it. Our department is really tasked with the, you're looking at a donut right now. We're really tasked with focusing on the red, orange, and blue portions of the donut, which are folks who are living below the median family income level. So you'll see we have goals over um, uh, 10 years. It's 60,000 units in total over 10 years, so 6,000 units a year to create or preserve income restricted housing for folks at or below 80% median family income. Um, we are guided by five very important underlying community values, which were um, really shouted out in the strategic housing blueprint. Um, and of course, it, they include creating new and affordable housing choices for all across um, all parts of Austin, um, as well as fostering equitable, integrated and diverse communities. You can find all the information you want and more on our website, uh, which includes the document, which is actually pretty reason readable, the Strategic Housing Blueprint, then our Blueprint um, scorecards, um, which look at uh, goals across city council districts and at different median family income levels, and a variety of related documents. Um, since we're talking about affordable housing and its connection to transit, um, I want to dig in a little bit to the 2018 affordable housing bonds. In 2018, voters approved $250 million for affordable housing. It was known as Proposition A. It included four different um, programs or buckets. This was actually our third tranche of affordable housing bonds. Voters first approved $60 million, um, I'm sorry, $55 million in 2006. In 2013, 65 million, and then in 2018, 250 million. A big jump, but of course, the need for affordability is huge. The four main buckets that we administer as a department, and they come under my division the first is land acquisition, we're going to talk about rental housing development assistance, $94 million. Um, this is over a five year spend plan. And this provides gap financing to for-profit and non-profit developers of affordable housing. Um, acquisition and development has been renamed Ownership Housing Development Assistance. That's 28 million. That's for non-profit and for-profit developers. Again, gap financing for the creation of affordable ownership housing. And then we also administer a home repair program. We're in partnership with seven different local nonprofits that provide home repairs for low-income homeowners. I'm going to dig a little bit into some of these, um, particularly Rhoda and Oda, that you all may find interesting, just to give you an overview of the last several years of projects that we have funded through Rhoda and Oda. Again, it's gap financing, so we provide a piece of the puzzle um, for Rhoda, our rental housing development. Those projects range from um, what's called single room occupancy, so for uh, generally efficiency apartments for folks exiting homelessness um, to family properties, um, both the Abali, the Loretta, um, and Go Valley Terrace all serve um, families who are at or below 50% um, and sometimes 30% of median family income. So very extremely reduced rents in a supportive environment. Um, and then we also have um, single room occupancy um, for uh, folks exiting homelessness, examples of that um, would include Zilker Studios and Asparrow at Rutland. Um, Zilker Studios is under construction and Asparrow at Rutland 
is going to start construction, knock on wood, um, in July of this year, and that's 171 units for folks exiting homelessness. We also have the ODA program, which provides funding um, to ensure that um, we have adequate supply of affordable ownership housing, ownership opportunities. Examples of that include the Chacon, which is um, a condominium development at 12th and Chacon, developed by Chestnut Neighborhood Revitalization Corporation. Um, we also have our very first mobile home park where we worked with a national nonprofit to create a cooperative mobile home park on uh, North Lamar. That was very exciting. We provided $2.5 million um, out of about an $8 million total budget for them to acquire their property and create um, uh, uh, a more sustainable mobile home community. Um, I'm going to go into this tool. Um, and so I just want you to know that we have an online tool that enables you to drill down um, interactively into our portfolio of affordable housing. So any housing that we have either subsidized as a city or incentivized um, as a city through one of our density bonus programs, like you may have heard of vertical mixed use along our transit lines or transit oriented development. Um, oftentimes, um, we are able to extract additional affordable income restricted units, long term affordability through those programs. Right now in our portfolio, we have a little more than 11,000 units. Um, and again, we'll drill down into this map, but you see this is overlaid onto the Project Connect map. And right now, about a third of the units we've subsidized are within a quarter mile of a Project Connect station and almost two thirds are within a half mile of a project connect station. Land acquisition, um, super important and a brand new source of funding, this hundred million dollars um, that we have been able to, we were tasked by our city council to go forth and uh, acquire uh, land um, for future affordable housing development. One thing we had heard from all of our development partners was they wanted to develop in strategic locations, whether it's high opportunity or gentrifying areas, but um, getting access to land um, was extraordinarily difficult and of course expensive. So we developed a land acquisition strategy which really prioritized um, a variety of different attributes of land that we would find compelling and wanna to bring to our city council for acquisition. Um, those attributes generally included alignment with high capacity transit or a proposed project connect line. Um, they also included being located in either a high opportunity area or an area experiencing gentrification. To date, you'll see these are all of the properties um, that we have acquired um, thus far. Uh, about 75 million uh, out of the 100 million has been uh, committed thus far. And you will note we have um, three different hotels that are included in here um, because of the increasing focus on homelessness. Um, our city council directed us to utilize some of the funding to acquire um, and reposition hotels for people experiencing homelessness. Um, again, this is the same tool, which I'm going to show you in a minute. Um, but it does show our current assets um, or uh, that will be repurposed for affordable housing. Uh, additional programs. I'm so glad Nefertiti uh, talked about the tenant stabilization programs. I do want to say that in addition to stabilizing tenants, we as a department historically have been very focused on um, providing stability for our low income homeowners throughout the city of Austin, many of whom are um, long-term Austinites and, and, and seniors. Um, we have a lot of folks who have lived generationally here in Austin, and we want to make sure that they have the ability uh, to stay in the city. So we operate a whole suite of home repair programs for from minor home repair um, to large home repair loan programs that provide, sometimes we even do complete reconstruction of homes. Um, for folks whose homes have fallen into uh, disrepair. disrepair. Um, we also provide information on mortgage relief options, uh, tax relief tools, and information on predatory lenders. Uh, so we, the Austin is my home initiative is officially being launched. 
um, and it will include links to all of our home repair programs. Additional tools, we're going to talk about this. If I can switch over my screen, this is the affordable housing and transit tool. And the only other thing I want to bring up before I switch my screen is the affordable housing search tool or the A host. You will note um, the, the uh, web address, it's publicly available, atxaffordablehousing.net. And this is a compilation of all income restricted rental housing throughout the city of Austin. Um, please spread it far and wide because it's an opportunity to folks for folks to um, enter some very basic information about themselves, their household size, their approximate income, um, whether or not they have a housing choice voucher, um, and up will pop information that will enable them to find and access affordable housing in city. Okay, let's see if you are, do you all see my, um, uh, the 26,663 number? Yes. Perfect. Okay. So again, this is publicly available and I'll make sure to drop it into the chat, um, our affordable housing and transit tool. Um, this shows, um, you see up at top, a variety of different tabs, which include um, all of the HPD is the housing and planning department. These are the rental um, units that we have either incentivized or subsidized. You'll see the previous in the presentation was a screenshot. So we've increased our affordable housing inventory. We're now a little over 11,500 units. I'm going to drill down here. Um, and you'll see the colored, um, the, the red, the yellow, the green, the blue, the purple, all represents Project Connect. Um, and looking at this, um, the thing that uh, pleases me is how we have both unintentionally and hopefully in the last several years intentionally aligned our investments um, around transit. Uh, one thing uh, we know, and this was foundational in Imagine Austin, is working to align um, where people live, including low-income people who may require access to public transportation. We want to align that, transportation, and jobs. Um, and if we can do that, we create a more equitable and sustainable for the long term, both a climate change perspective and economic perspective, just a much more sustainable city. So you will see here, all of these blue dots represent projects that the city of Austin has invested in, in one way or another. Let me see if I can drill down that Saltillo station, drill down in these dots, and it will tell you something about the project. This is Pathways at Chalmers Court, which is a housing authority project. Um, the housing authority has three of the oldest um, housing authority developments in the country, and they have just gone through they're in their third phase of a three-phase project to redevelop um, Chalmers Courts. Um, and, and you'll note um, this is where it's located. So it tells you a little bit about the project, the property, um, and um, who, who owns it. Here you'll see this is Villas on Six, which actually a subsidiary of the city of Austin that we had uh, managed called Austin ha um, AHFC. Um, it's the uh, Housing Finance Corporation for the city of Austin. Um, and we actually own this property. We developed with a private developer um, about 16 years ago through the tax credit program. There are actually, there's 136 affordable income restricted units here. Um, there's a total of 160 units and it's incredible because it is right on East 6th Street within uh, a quarter mile of really three different um, existing or planned lines, the red line, the green line, and then the purple line as well. So you'll note, again, I'm just going to zoom out. Each of these, the dark gray represents the quarter mile around the Project Connect station. All of these blue dots uh, represent um, affordable housing development. We also have a tab for ownership. Um, we have a tab, we call this non-city, but um, this is showing all of the other income restricted um, affordable housing, um, but not necessarily subsidized by the city of Austin. And you'll see over on the right, um, if we do not subsidize or incentivize it, uh, it is less likely uh, to be within proximity of a Project Connect station um, 
although still a pretty, uh, pretty decent um, uh, alignment with Project Connect. Um, I had also mentioned city assets. I want to make sure you all are aware of this. These are all properties. They're still being loaded in properties that we've acquired. Um, and again, our focus is acquisition of properties in alignment with our um, uh, acquisition strategy. Um, and then disposition. Uh, a year ago, we um, put out for solicitation our first two parcels. Um, one is was on Tillery, 1127 Tillery Street. Let me see if I can, oh, it's gonna really zoom in there. There it is, uh, 1127 Tillery Street. And then we also had one on Gardner Lane. Um, and uh, those were put out for solicit uh, competitive solicitation and we're currently working with the successful proposers um, on lining up their financing. And we hope to be under construction with both of these projects um, within a reasonable amount of time. Um, expiring affordability. I will just note that all um, of our income restricted property, anything in this portfolio um, is income restrict legally restricted. So it has a time frame. If it's a tax credit project, it may range from 30 years of affordability um, to 55 years of affordability. If it's a vertical mixed use, it's 40 years of affordability. We track all of that. So we know, and these stats um, over to the right show us when and which year we have expiring affordability. So we can target our subsidies or incentives to hopefully recapitalize those projects or expand the affordability. And then the last thing I'll do before I am, am quiet is um, also highlight that as part of this um, housing and transit, and this ties closely to Project Connect, we are keenly tuned into where we have areas that are experiencing gentrification and displacement. Um, and you'll note here the hot pink and the light pink and the blues um, are those areas that are susceptible um, or continued loss related to gentrification and displacement. And so we are really um, trying to focus our, um, our investments, particularly when it's aligned up with transit, because as Nefertiti mentioned, with this 300 million anti-displacement, um, we wanna make sure that the investments we make um, are not exacerbating displacement, but in fact, providing opportunities um, for folks who are existing um, in the neighborhood right now for them to continue living in the neighborhood and take advantage of um, the increased transit investment. So I'm just going to drill down in this area. You'll note that this is called a, it's a dynamic um, uh, uh, typology, uh, Central East Austin a little bit farther out. And so there, of course, this shows some existing affordable housing in South Street. There's one affordable unit there. Um, we are, again, concerned with um, all of these units and to figure out how we can continue to invest in affordability in these areas um, so we can help stabilize the neighborhoods, the communities, the populations, um, and make sure that everybody can take advantage of this wonderful investment in high capacity transit known as Project Connect. So I shall stop sharing, or I think I will if I know how to. There we go. I did it. I think I did it. Yes, thank you. Um, and I'm welcome. Okay. Oh, thank you. Somebody already put in there all of the tools. Good. So I don't have to figure out how to do that. But happy to take any questions. I know that was a lot of information and, um, you know, our department, <laughs> we, we do a lot of stuff. So I, I know Nefertiti would welcome questions as well. Yes, thank you both for sharing um, what the city is up to. And I think it was for me, I felt very encouraged that there is so much going on because it seems like, you know, at the surface, all you hear is the negative stuff, and uh, we don't do a good job of kind of publicly celebrating the the achievements of your department. So that was really nice to hear. Does anyone have any questions for either of our presenters tonight? Feel free to pop them in the chat or just unmute yourself and shout them out. 
Um, I have a question, Sis Lauren. Um, I was wondering how these efforts kind of overlap with um, the urban tree canopy and, and how um, that land acquisition, if there's any kind of a effort to try to um, overlay um, our, our tree canopy, which is so important for health reasons in the city. So that is interesting. And I will say there has not thus far been an intentional effort to do so. But as we talk to different groups and kind of do a roadshow around this housing and transit tool, which was created last summer, so it's now you know, nine months old, um, we have heard from different groups about a desire to overlay different GIS layers. And that would be a fantastic um, that would be a fantastic overlay. And I will say, just so you know, we have been very fortunate to uh, have partnered with the Parks and Recreation Department on two of our acquisitions, um, one on Tillery, the other on Slaughter, so one in District 5 and one in um, District 3, um, where we had areas that were um, either underparked or in need of kind of neighborhood community-based parks. And so we were able to kind of over acquire um, and then uh, sell or leverage really the parks bonds um, in order to subdivide the property so that we could have the affordable housing and a park, which to me is a win-win. I anticipate doing more of that in the future, but as we go about our acquisition strategy, we are talking with all of our partner departments, um, including watershed protection, including um, uh, parks and Recreation. We've also been talking with the Capital Corridor Program because they have some needs. Um, and just making sure that we're utilizing our funding most strategically and leveraging our different resources um, in that way. That's good to hear. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think in some cases um, when they um, look to um, some ideal evaluate different sites for some of these projects. Um, in some cases, it, it, it really points the finger to a very careful design to try to maintain some of the existing green infrastructure um, working around it in the design. And if it's not done, then it, it becomes kind of a scrape and redo, which is kind of removing not only natural environment, but history and the cultural, you know, aspect of big trees or you know green areas that were have been treasured for for years by by people absolutely and i will say i'd have to go back and look at our acquisition list um but several of our larger um, parcels are not heavily treated at all i'm thinking of 1212 slaughter um and so uh i know the neighborhood is going to welcome the opportunity to create a neighborhood park and create more true green space that includes um that includes trees in the future. Um, but the 12, 1127 Tillery site um, is heavily treed. And when we did the solicitation, one of our panelists who helped to select uh, the proposer uh, was somebody from Parks and Recreation. And we were part of the required response was related to preservation of existing um, trees and how they would incorporate this tricky site um, how they would incorporate the development and make it compatible with the existing trees and a proposed park. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And like Mueller that used, you know, used to be an airport. So it was like acreage of just nothing. It's definitely to improve a gray field to bring in green. It's like, it seems like that would put a, um, a premium on evaluating sites to, you know, say, you know, these are the areas that are hot spots. Like literally this is how we can, this, maybe makes it more attractive because it's you know it's a it's a black field or gray field or whatever um a hard hardscape and we can improve upon that yeah absolutely thank you lauren for your question and, and for the information mandy we have got another question in the chat from bill he says i'm glad to hear of the focus on locating affordable transit near transit or affordable housing near transit stations uh, is there any intent to include ground level mixed use in larger housing developments to provide convenient services for residents in the units and nearby? So yes, there is. 
Um, I, we don't have any specific local examples to point to, but we do have some fantastic, we've been researching fantastic national as well as statewide examples. I'm, I'm embarrassed to say Dallas is ahead of us. Um, they've got a project under construction that we're really interested in because it combines um, our primary financing of affordable housing, which is the low income housing tax credit, um, along with commercial mixed use. Um, and so we have an example there and we know that um, particularly in you know, adjacency to a transit oriented development demands both residential and commercial aspects to it. Um, so yes, we are very interested. I will say we will need to make sure that we have in place, which I think we do along the blue line, but the other lines in place, the appropriate regulating plans to support that type of development. So yes, we are, we are very interested in that. We have either acquired property that would lend itself to that type of development, um, or we have our eyes on a couple of really great parcels that would definitely be mixed use, mixed income. That's great. I think there's a lot of opportunities talking of layers and overlays, right? With sort of the tree coverage, talking about food deserts, talking about, um, access to health care. I know there's examples you've probably seen of um, public private partnerships or partnerships with um, health care providers like insurance providers who support affordable housing development um, with like clinics and you know sit stuff in the building or that residents have access to um, who may not otherwise have. Have we have a, to go get yeah, absolutely. And we have a couple of small scale examples that I could point to um, in the Miller. Somebody mentioned the Miller development. Um, we do have two tax credit properties, both of which have commercial condominiumized commercial space on the ground floor. Um, it's a minor part of the development, but it does exist. We also have um, Terrace at Oak Springs, which is a, a partnership with the uh, um, uh, Integral Care, our mental health authority, uh, they do have a public clinic in that facility, um, in that it's a residential development, 50 units, with a, a public clinic in it. Um, I am anticipating that we are going to see more and more of that, uh, because really the community demands it, and our financing is starting to recognize that, that we can line up all of those dollars appropriately. And some of the examples uh, that I sort of ran out of time and didn't highlight, uh, there was an example in Denver. And, and, and sometimes this is how we get to uh, including those extra services is really understanding what the needs of the community are, right? And so uh, in Denver, uh, it's, it, it was listed as a successful investment or investment is because they listened to community residents, understood what their needs were, and funding was allocated for some of those other services that community members uh, needed and requested. And again, it's important to have those located in close proximity and with, uh, within walking distance to where people live. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. Well, we are right uh, just a bit can over 6.30, so, oh, sorry. Can I, get one, can I get one in, Ashley? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, the, the background noise stopped, so I can I can unmute now. Uh, but I, I like I liked your point, Ashley, about the, the medical services, because I think in many of the affordable housing area, uh, areas in need of affordable housing, uh, that's, that's def definitely a shortage, um, and I think that that's a good fit. Um, I really wanted to ask Mandy, um, do you remember the name of that example in Dallas? Uh, I think they're way ahead of us on transit, of course, but uh, I'm curious to know what that particular one is because it sounds like a good example and I'm interested always to hear more. Okay, it is under construction. Of course, you asked me and I can't remember. It is supposed to be, um, and it is at a, it's not BART. What is the, what is their transit? DART, it's DART. Dart. <laughs> Sorry, I'm in the wrong city. Um, sure. It's not BART, it's DART. And uh, it is right in a Todd. It is being developed, 
I'm going to find it. I might be able to, my computer. be able to find it as quickly. It began with a B. Um, Maybe if you happen to think of it and you want to shoot uh, Kendall and I an email, we can distribute that to the attendees. I will do it. It's a public private partnership. It was really cool. It's 300 plus units. Um, it's got the housing authority has uh, some subsidy involved. It's a, a light tech deal. It's and then it's got um, commercial uses as well. It's kind of like the whole shebang. Yeah, that sounds great. That that does sound great. I want to thank both pre presenters and also Ashley. This was awesome. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Bill. And thank you very much, Mandy and Nefertiti. We really appreciate your time this evening and all the great information you shared with us. Um, for those of you uh, who want to kind of read, digest some of this information, the recording will be posted probably next week um, when it pops back. And, um, It'll be on our website, so please feel free to share with the group. Thank you tonight. Thank you. Thanks very much. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you. Hi, uh, you too. Thanks.